This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Has it ever seemed strange to you that Hebrew disciples of a Hebrew Messiah living in a Hebrew culture would write their gospel accounts in Greek? Surely there must be some mistake. That just doesn't make sense, not to mention there are cultural idioms that simply don't translate into Greek or any other language. There certainly is something wrong with this picture, and as it turns out, the Gospels were originally written in Hebrew, and the difference that makes could answer questions about your faith and your Bible that you've had for years. Miles Jones and Michael Rood present the answers you're looking for tonight because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Hey, tonight is the final episode of a series that is opening eyes and making those who question their Bible, well, they're gonna breathe a sigh of relief now because the questions that you've been struggling with for years are because the Gospels were translated from Greek, which does not adequately articulate Hebrew concepts of a Hebrew Messiah. But now there's proof that the Gospels were originally written in Hebrew, and that makes all the difference. This is going to be exciting, so stay tuned for the final episode Episode of Survival of the Hebrew Gospels with Michael Rood and Miles Jones. Another revelation, well, the so-called wise men were on their journey to visit the Messiah during this week in history, but he was not a baby. He was a 14-month-old toddler at this point. We know that thanks to the timeline we see in the Chronological Gospels Bible, and it's noted this month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. And you'll see it on your screen there, and uh, let's talk a little bit more about this calendar and the misunderstandings about the Bible with the founder of Rood Awakening International, Michael Rood. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be back with you again. Indeed. So now, a lot of the answers that we find uh, about this time of year are not found, actually, in the Bible at all because they took them out. Well, this is the time that everyone really needs to study the Book of Maccabees. Uh, it was originally in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. It was taken out in 1885, and once it was taken out, we were bereft of, of absolutely a essential information that it takes to understand the Gospels. Uh, we understand that uh, in the eighth chapter of John, verse 12, through the end of chapter 10, Yeshua went up to the Feast of Hanukkah, hmm. translated into the English Bible as the Feast of Dedications, but without the information that is in the book of Maccabees, we don't understand what Hanukkah is about. Hmm. And we really don't understand that, that at the time that Herod was sent out to execute of uh, the male children, that was the time of Hanukkah again. So we are replaying history. It's like it was a prophetic shadow picture of Antiochus Epiphanes as the anti-Messiah, as the Antichrist, and Herod was the real Antichrist. He went out to absolutely, actually kill the Messiah. So in addition to what you and Miles are talking about tonight on the fourth episode of uh, Survival of the Hebrew Gospel, it's not just a matter of mistranslating because we thought that the original manuscripts are Greek, and then we translate to English and totally miss the Hebrew point, we actually took some out of the Bible, which is now in the, what's known as the Apocrypha. That, that's right. Now, this is the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible. This was in it, and as a matter of fact, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars and a year in prison for anyone who would publish the Bible without the book of Maccabees mm. in it. And so that's why it was so essential, uh, because the... Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury understood that you can't really understand the Gospels if you don't have the Apocrypha, if you don't have uh, specifically the Book of Maccabees. You can't understand what Yeshua says about the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel because the Book of Maccabees was taken out of her Bible, which the abomination of desolation had already transpired once, and he's talking about 
it transpiring again in the future. And so that's why it's so important to understand this. And, and people need to understand that those who say, you know, the, the King James is, is important, and I believe it is, the King James Version only people need to realize this was in the King James Version hmm. to begin with until the American Bible Society decided to take it out. You know, one of my favorite Bibles at home, because uh, first of all, uh, they spell the name of God correctly in it. Well, as far as English goes, Yehovah, they put it in there. Uh, the Jerusalem Bible. I love the Jerusalem Bible. I have a copy of that at home. I believe that was originally a Catholic Bible, but it has the Apocrypha in it. And so that's why I love it. And it's in plain language. It's almost like a, uh, what one might, one might call the, a living Bible that's, you know, that, that's properly translated. <laughs> right, that's right. even possible. But, <laughs> but that's a great book to have. And I, I love reading the, uh, the book of Maccabees in there because you're, you're right, it does explain things and that Yeshua was not a baby at this time. He was a 14-month-old toddler. That's now, right. Where were they living at this it time? It says that, that the, the Chaldean astronomers uh -huh. that brought the treasure from Babylon that was put into their hands generations ago by Daniel, who was a very wealthy satrap, a governor, or... Uh, almost a king under the emperor, he was the one that laid it into the hands of the Chaldean Jewish astronomers and said, when you see this sign in the heavens, then you take this and put it at the feet of my Lord. Mm. And so that's why they came to the house where the young child was. And so we are given the, the details, and, and I cover this in great detail in the first series on the Chronological Gospels, ah. uh, season one. Excellent. Well, people can get that uh, in our stores. Oh, that, this available. is a good time yeah. of year to get that. Uh, this is a great gift, a Hanukkah gift, uh, to give to people out there if they want to understand the Gospels. Indeed. Speaking of gifts, now you have something in your hand which is brand new. Uh, you see before us, this is the love gift for December. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. But uh, something that you may not be aware of is that we now have, Michael, your teaching on the tr trouble in Ephesus in Spanish, which reads, Desterbio en Efeso. <laughs> Love it. Or something like that. <laughs> and this is the same teaching in Greek, uh, translated, of course, uh, it's like we do all of our other Spanish translations, uh, with uh, Alvaro, who does the voice of Michael Rood on this mm -hmm. teaching. That's right. And uh, the gifts are available as well. So you can get this now in Spanish at, at the uh, at the link you're seeing at the bottom of your screen. So that's and, available and this, now. This is, we're really, we are hoping that not only will our English partners, but our Spanish partners will, will really step up to help us do this uh, because we're putting this out at great expense into these other languages and now we're doing this in Spanish which takes an entire team to do it. It's really a production that takes more time and more energy than me originally speaking this. But it is such essential information for us to understand and understand the book of Acts and so we need everyone to stand with us to help us uh, in this process of getting all this material into the Spanish language. Indeed, and we've heard this, uh, we had a meeting this morning uh, with the Rude crew, and we learned that our Spanish uh, YouTube page is doing phenomenally well. Uh, more views on it than we ever thought possible, so things are just rocketing ahead. So we, I would really encourage you, like Michael says, if you know somebody, or if you speak Spanish, you'd love to have us teaching in Spanish, great, but if you have a friend who speaks Spanish and is struggling with their faith and they wanna know the truth, oh, get them this. Yeah, that, this is a real treasure. Yeah, indeed. All right. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate your time today. All righty. Well, coming up, the contradictions in the Bible that uh, other people have asked you about are not contradictions at all. Well, are they? They are translation errors that have now been cleared up thanks to the discovery that the Gospels are, and always have been, originally written in Hebrew. And tonight we're going to learn about the people who kept those manuscripts alive through the ages. It's the final episode of Survival of the Hebrew Gospels with Michael Root and Miles Jones right after this. Clashing head-on with worshippers of the moon goddess Diana and with those who made their living selling likenesses of her, Paul is surrounded in Ephesus by a rioting mob, bent on protecting their pagan traditions and their livelihoods from the truth of the gospel. Our world today is no different. And this is exactly what Paul is teaching. He's teaching the Gentiles to not forsake Moses, but forsake all of their paganism and come back to the truth. That is Israel's job. That has been Israel's job from the very beginning. Trouble in Ephesus by Michael Root offers a sobering parallel to modern times. 
learn how we can use Paul's example to expose the distorted rituals of modern Christianity that distract from the prophecy-fulfilling truth of Yeshua's birth, death, and resurrection. You won't see this teaching anywhere else, and it's not for sale, but you can get it as a thank you from Michael Rood for your love gift donation of $50. Donate $100 or more, and you'll also receive this beautiful box of God's promises, over 100 of the Bible's most encouraging promises, kept in a beautiful glass case, featuring a scene from the Jaffa Gate in Jerusalem. Or for a gift of $300 or more, you'll receive the teaching, the glass box of promises, and this solid wood and silver-plated hollow bread cutting board. This exquisite showpiece features beautiful silver-plated artwork and even includes an engraved bread knife. Get this collection now, available in December only. It's a thank you gift from Michael Rood in appreciation of your support of Rood Awakening International. You'll get the Trouble in Ephesus teaching for a love gift donation of $50, the teaching and the glass box of promises for a gift of $100 or more, or get everything plus the solid wood and silver plated breadboard for a love gift donation of $300 or more. Get these gifts now while supplies last. Donate by phone at 800-788-7887 or visit monthlylovegift.com. See it now at A Root Awakening International. The Temple Treasures Exhibit. Remarkably accurate, full-scale replicas of the most precious furnishings in the Tabernacle and the Second Temple. The Torah, the Menorah, the Table of Showbread, and the Altar of Incense. Plus, the world's only accurate-sized model of Ron Wyatt's eyewitness account of the Ark of the Covenant. The Temple Treasures Exhibit. Book your tour now at templetreasuresexhibit.com. Traditions that we inherited from Babylon through Constantine have us occasionally with a little plastic cup and a little round wafer in a church service having what is called communion. But Yeshua was not having communion with his disciples. It was the last meal before his crucifixion, which happened at the time the Passover lambs were being sacrificed the following morning. Yeshua took this opportunity to explain something that had been embedded in the, the Israelite culture for then over a thousand years. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine to Abraham and he blessed the Most High, saying, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Yeshua said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. And so we break this bread and we do it in remembrance of him. Likewise, Yeshua took the cup and he blessed the Most High with that blessing that Melchizedek blessed the Most High. Baruch Atah Yehovah. Eloheinu melech ha'olam, borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah our Elohim, the king of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. Yeshua said, this represents my shed blood, which will be poured out for the remission of sin. I will not drink another drop of the fruit of the vine. You take my cup and divide it among yourselves because I won't drink it until I drink it again with you in my father's kingdom. In the marriage supper of the lamb, Yeshua will lift this cup and he will say, Lahai, to life everlasting. And until then, we remember what he's done and remember that marriage supper of the Lamb. Get ready. After 38 years of work, I published the Chronological Gospels, the life and 70 week ministry of the Messiah. It was a result of putting the more than 300 individual incidents in the life and ministry of Yeshua in exact chronological order. It is only when things are in chronological order that we have cause and effect, that things make sense, that you understand why things are said, to whom they are said, why they are said, what goes on before, what happens afterwards is all part of the context of Yeshua's ministry in declaring the gospel of the kingdom. These are the words of Yeshua, these are his teachings. The prophet 
that we must hear and obey. And I wanted to have those words clarified, and I wanted to understand them in context. When Nehemiah Gordon handed to me the manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew with the correct lineage of Yeshua through his only parent, Miriam, that goes back to King David. Once I had the lineage correct, which does not occur in Greek, it does not occur really in even Aramaic, but when the Hebrew Matthew was found with the correct lineage, then I knew this is time to go to print with it. Now after I printed this, then other people got involved because they saw that this was making sense but I needed some backup on it and uh, unbeknownst to me, Dr. Miles Jones stepped in to cover what I had been working on uh, for more than three decades at that point and we have Miles Jones back with us because of his work with the Hebrew Gospels. Miles, good to have you back Thank with you. us. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I, I appreciate what, what you did. You came to my defense without me even knowing it uh, on the chronological Gospels in the things that I was stipulating uh, when I had, uh, I had found a solution, the solution, I believe, to the chronology in the Gospels. And uh, I was wondering if you would uh, uh, take a, a few minutes to tell us about that because you found even more backup right. supporting evidence uh, in your work. Right, if you watch the Passover segment with uh, Nehemiah and John LaRoquette, uh, they found some, they did some amazing, brilliant research that showed it did not occur in earlier edition of the Bibles. The, okay. the insertion in John 6, 4. Okay, yeah, may, maybe maybe I, I need to, to uh, state what that particular situation is. Um, uh, because uh, for, for most people out there, they, they don't know how the chronology lays out. Uh -huh. Because the, the Gospels are laid out, uh, the... The context really is Yeshua fulfilling what every male Israelite must do, must perform. Every male Israelite must go up to the feast of the Lord at Jerusalem three times a year. And the Gospels are the record of him going up to each one of these feasts. Mm -hmm. We see the first Passover that Yeshua goes up right. to after his mikvah, after his immersion, is the Passover in John chapter two and three. Right. Then after Passover, the next feast is Shavuot. That is John chapter five. Mm -hmm. And those who understand the feast of Shavuot know very clearly exactly how it transpires, what happens there, and this is very clearly Shavuot. Uh, or Pentecost, but anyone in the Gentile world would have no idea what this is about because they know nothing about the feast. Right, so that's, but, that's but, why John includes all the feast days, totally unnecessary for the Hebrews. They don't need that, but the Greek readers, it's required for them to understand it. Right. But they don't know much about it, so they just simply got some things wrong. In their right, head. but, but uh, what, what we have is John 2 and 3, Passover, mm -hmm. the next feast he goes up to, and John 5 is the feast of Shavuot. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, the next feast, which is the feast of Sukkot in John chapter 7. Then the next feast that he goes up to is Hanukkah in okay. John chapter 8. 8 through 10, right. and then he comes back at the time of Purim and raises Lazarus from the dead, but neither Purim nor Hanukkah are the feast of the Lord. These are specified as Jewish feast. Mm -hmm. uh, memorials like our, our Thanksgiving in America. That is an American feast, but it's a Thanksgiving to God. Okay, but the next feast he must go up to, and it shows us, is John chapter 12, Yeshua goes up to Passover in which he is crucified. Okay. All the early church fathers all said Yeshua's ministry was about one, one year. year. It is one heretic, I will say, in the fourth century who denied 300 years of testimony and said Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. And that was and, the first time that theory was heard of. That, that's right, and so what happened happened at that point is that a feast of the Lord uh, uh, appears in John chapter six. Mm -hmm. A feast of the Lord at the feeding of the 5,000 at the end of the summer, 
We're coming up on fall, and all of the gospel authors record the feeding of the 5,000, but in John, there were words that were added to later Greek text. Mm -hmm. This says, in Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. With that Passover, that destroys the, the one-year ministry. It that does. All the early church fathers said, and so then we found manuscripts that John 6, 4 is not there at all. It was a forgery that was added in mm -hmm. in an attempt to lengthen his ministry artificially to come up with a nonsensical, absolutely ridiculous three and a half year ministry. Right. That's and, where you got involved. Yes, and the viewers should know that uh, Michael never asked me to do this, but like Michael, I recognize that this is a key to the truth of the Gospels and to the messing around with Scripture that the Greeks had done. Now, the, the insertion, and it is very clearly an insertion, it is one of 60 third-person insertions in John. It was edited by the Greeks because when you say a feast day of the Jews, it means you're not a Jew. When you refer to the author of the gospel right. as him, it means you're not him. You, you would just say what the feast was. Yes. You wouldn't say there was a feast of the Jews. That, that's, right. that, is, they, that, they, that just shows their ignorance. The Gentiles didn't know what these feasts were. If you'll show this slide we have, they were not mentioned in the other gospels. They all mentioned the final Passover. But in John... And it's a good thing. He did mention all of them. That was necessary mm -hmm. for the Greek readers. But they're very ignorant of them. So when they put, you have each one of the feast days mentioned in order, which fulfills the, gospel, the testimony of the other scriptures that it was one year. Mm -hmm. But then when they, when they inserted in John 6, 4, a Passover, a feast day of the Jews in error, that yeah, at the end of the, the entire, summer, right? So you add a whole half year of dead silence in, right? And because Passover's in the spring, right? And right. to get to a Passover, he never goes up to, right? And everyone is required to go up. They to. are required. Nobody to. shows up to it. Even Pharisees are in the Galilee at this time, right? So he's he's mentioning in the same breath that the the feast of unleavened bread is nigh. How are we going to find leavened bread for this crowd? That which makes no sense. It's clearly. It is an insertion, but it's out of context when you see the verses that come before mm -hmm. and after it. And also he takes John 5, 1, which just says a feast day of the Jews, and he says that's another Passover. So what you get... Oh, that's what, that's what Eusebius came up with. Yes, yeah, that's yeah, another saying, Passover. Saying that uh, John 5, which is clearly Shavuot, seven weeks after the day of first fruits of, pa of uh, Passover of John 2 and 3... Right. You know, there, there's no other feast there. It is the, the feast that's required. And he turns that into another Passover a year later. Because you have to have four Passovers to have three and a half years. Right. So he had to insert two Passovers, not just one. Right. So he said 5 1 was another yeah, Passover. Yeah, that's, uh, that's why I call him an ignorant heretic. Right. Well, that, you, that's what he was. No, ignorant he, of the he feast was. of if, the Lord. If you're inserting things in the Bible that don't belong there, you are a heretic. And this is, this is what I did, if you can see this chart. Now, I, I took this from your work. So all the little numbers you can't see, those are the event numbers in the chronological gospel. Okay. And what I'm trying to show here, to cover for the three and a half year ministry, Eusebius slipped into John 6, 4, uh, they will say, well, you know, the gospels, they weren't in strict chronological order, they jumped around. Well, look at this. I bracketed four common events in the Gospels and mentioned in each one of the Gospels, mm -hmm. not counting John 6, 4. And you can say they are very consistent. They're very right. consistent right. in the order of these events that happened. So these events were the baptism of Yeshua, which is mentioned in all the all the Gospels, the baptism of water is not mentioned in John, but the baptism of the Spirit is. So I did cluster graphing. You had more strict criteria. The next one was the feeding of the 5,000, followed by the events of the Last Supper and the arrest uh, of Yeshua, and then the final resurrection events, including the ascension. So mm -hmm. all of these were mentioned two or three times. Some of the elements were mentioned. Right. So we can be sure these things were mentioned in there. So you had those four brackets, and here they are without all the little tiny event numbers. And you can see, again, very consistent, very consistent. Right. So mm -hmm. if there were three and a half years in John, this is what it would look like. You have the 70 week ministry of Yeshua and the other three gospels that is contradicted by the three and a half year gospel in John. And that just doesn't work. 
besides which it makes it real evident to see that nothing happened in the first two years of his ministry after he was baptized. Nothing happened for two years. Nothing so, worth recording. Yeah, so th that doesn't make any sense, and it also contradicts what he said. Really? Uh, Yeshua said, you have witnessed the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a couple years off, and then we'll get started, right? <laughs> That's, <laughs> the say, the acceptable year of the Lord, right. and he took a break. Right, so <laughs> the three and a half ministry doesn't work. And now, this, now, we run into another uh, problem in that, is that if you have a three and a half year ministry, from his ministry's beginning, you have skewed out the entire timeline, and the Passovers don't work, yes, nothing works after that. And you would also have to, if this were true, three and a half year ministry, you would have had multiple mentions of, uh, of, of the feast days. And there's only one for each, for each feast day. Right. So we can be pretty sure John was right in line with the same chronology of the other three Gospels, does not contradict their testimony. And we know for a fact that John 6, 4 was an insertion because it says it is. He said, a feast day of the Jews. This is a Greek editor putting mm. this in there. Mm -hmm. And right. there are 60 of these in John. So we know it says in the signature page at the end of John that we know his testimony is true. So the editors are telling you, they're telling you straight out, they got these materials and they wrote down John's testimony and they know it's true. Referring to him, we know his testimony is true. Mm -hmm. These are third person assertions by a Greek editor. Try to explain them away, it doesn't matter, it's all BS. The overwhelming probability and, is and that they, it was written by someone else. They are glowing to a Jewish believer. They, they can see it, you know. We have, found the, the, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, this or, is, this is, are you thinking of the Samaritan woman at the well? Uh, no, I'm thinking about when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Andrew went and found Peter. Yes. We found the Messiah, right. which is interpreted the Christ. Yes. You know, interpreted a language we don't even speak, exactly. the Christ. That, that's stupid. And that, that happened again with uh, his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. And she says to him, we well, know I know that the Messiah comes, who is called, called the Christ. The Christ. See, He's now, there, no, no. there weren't even any, there not only were no Greek gospels at the time, there were no Greek believers at the time. Right, these so, are Samaritans. Right, so. You who, know, they write in Paleo-Hebrew to this day. They speak in Hebrew. Right, so who's going to be calling him the Christ before there are any Greek believers or any Greek gospels? Yeah. It's not yeah. going to happen. So those words were put into her mouth in order to authenticate the Greek Christ just like they put Easter into Acts after the fact to right. authenticate the name of the pagan holiday as the holiday you know, of Passover. And, right. and it says in the Greek manuscript, it actually says it was Pasha, which comes from Pesach. Mm -hmm. It was Passover, it wasn't Easter. Easter literally is another day. You know, and they, right. they did it then so they would not be worshiping at the same time as the Jews and the Messianics. They purposefully wanted right. to totally cut themselves off from the Jews and not do anything that they were doing. So they literally right. were, and they weren't even so coy weird. about it, they literally replaced the, the sacred feast days with pagan the feast days. Feast of the Lord, and now they replace it with the reincarnation of the wife of Nimrod. Yes, the of queen of all things. The queen of the heaven. The queen of heaven. Who created a rabbit that lays eggs. <laughs> <laughs> then we all we all are still chasing still that rabbit. Still doing that today. We're right. still chasing and, uh, that rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> so what the to 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 kind of defend themselves against this, they came up with these two gospels of John that had six four in it that they claim were from the second century. Yeah, yeah tell us about that. Uh, P sixty six and seven. Right, P sixty six and and uh, what seventy four. Uh, seven, seventy four in the Bodmer collection there. P Bodmer two and fifteen. So they analyze, uh, analyze he's Brett, Brett Nongbri, who's a great, great paleological linguist. He's really great. He said, well, these, all this collection came from the Pacomanian monastery, the Greek monastery. It was in Egypt. But they're all from the 4th and 5th century. The monastery was established in the 4th century. So these are the works of the scribe of that monastery over the next couple of centuries. Mm -hmm. But then they pick two of them out and date them 200 years earlier. 
obviously to cover for the three and a half year ministry, you know, promulgated in John 6, 4. But when you look at them, if you can put this up on the screen. Uh, let's look at them. Two, the ones in red, two gospels, they dated centuries earlier than the others. And they're, they're different Greek manuscripts, but if you just take the other biblical, they were Coptic Greek manuscripts, you can see the same thing. They're all fourth and fifth century. And then they're going to tell you, yeah, but these two Gospels of John, they're second century. Well, it just doesn't work. When he analyzes the, the, the content of them themselves, it's not just the context. When he analyzes the content, they come up with this. This is the Tau Rho Stargram, it's called, which is the sign of the cross. The, the sign of the cross, the cross was not put into the creed until Constantine in the fourth century. The word right. cross is not in the Greek New Testament anywhere. Right. So when... Constantine puts in the creed in the fourth century, and they use this starogram of the cross in that that uh, codex. That comes from the fourth century. The binding comes from the fourth century. The content of the the phrasing comes from the fourth century. In fact, it it agrees ninety five percent with the with the wording in the Codex Vaticanus, which comes from the fourth century. This is a fourth century document. It's clearly to cover cover their tracks on misidentifying. So, yeah, so they deliberately misidentified this to bring it to, to an cover. early time frame mm-hmm. to try to get John 6, 4 uh, legitimized. Right. And it's not, it, it is abhorrent. Mm-hmm. It is a complete destruction of the gospel chronology and makes Yeshua's ministry pure nonsense. It does, and these, these were, this was one of the two big pillars in the Roman church that they used to hammer the other churches in obedience because they were heretics. They were wrong thinkers, right? And they, the Roman church took unto itself the authority to actually execute any of their believers that was thinking wrongly, was thinking uh, heretically. Mm-hmm. So there's a second period, the second pillar First one was the three and a half year ministry. This also affected the second great pillar, which is changing the day of worship from the Sabbath day, as it says in the Bible in the Ten Commandments, to the Lord's day, right? So in, in it, because it, three and a half year ministry pushes his crucifixion up two more years, right? From 30, right. from 31 AD. And you can see in 31 AD, he fulfills the sign of Jonah. On, on twilight of, of Wednesday, April 25th, Passover that year, he, is, he goes into the tomb mm-hmm. and he rises from the tomb in um, the evening, in the twilight, the evening of the Sabbath day, right? right? On the Sabbath day at the end mm-hmm. of it, which makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, but when absolutely. you move it up two more years to 33 AD, then fri- Passover happens on Friday, April the 3rd, so he is put in the tomb in the evening, he spends one night, then Saturday day, one day, Saturday night, one night, then he arises in the morning, and it says in scripture, they arrived there at the tomb before the first light of the morning, and he was already gone, because he'd already risen the evening before, he's already gone, so that's only three days, half. Only right. half of the sign of Jonah. So you, you really have severe uh, biblical revisionism, historical revisionism, you know, literally fake news, the narrative <laughs> of the day, which was uh, to meld pagan sun god worship mm-hmm. in with the Bible. Right. This is Constantine saying. Hey, uh, the, the second pillar, we've got to come back to it because we've got to take a break real quick here. And uh, and for those of you who are not aware, the most repeated prophecy uh, that Yeshua speaks is that the prophecy that you get one sign and one sign only. It's the sign of Jonah. That is a sign of his authenticity. As the angel Gabriel said that there would be certain things that would have to happen in order to authenticate the prophet. The, not the prophecy, but the prophet. The prophet whom we must hear and obey. Ladies and gentlemen, Yeshua is that prophet, the one we must hear and obey. He is the one who told his disciples, go out and make other disciples in all nations and teach them what I taught you. 
That is what we are doing. With everything that we have, we are attempting to teach what Yeshua taught. We're not telling you sweet baby Jesus stories. We're not telling you stories about Jesus. We are teaching what Yeshua taught because that is the gospel of the kingdom. And this is what must be proclaimed in all the world. This is what he told just the three disciples on the, uh, on the Mount of Olives just the two days before his crucifixion, that the gospel of the kingdom that he was preaching must be preached in the whole world. We are doing that. We need your help. And we're gonna give you this time. If you appreciate what we're doing, then this is your opportunity to give. If you don't like what we're doing, change the channel. You just got a minute. We're discussing the two pillars of replacement theology with Dr. Miles Jones. The first pillar being the three and a half year ministry, which is a fabrication of Eusebius in the fourth century, and the changing of God's holy Sabbath, the day he said to remember and keep it holy, a day that Yeshua kept with absolute sanctity, violating the rules of the Pharisees on the Sabbath day, but never violating the laws of the Almighty, but yet all of this was violated by the new Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new world order religion of Rome. And so, Miles, tell us about these pillars. Well, they all come from John 6, 4. That's why I recognize, like you did, like Nehemiah did, this is the key to understanding the Gospels and the things that have been done to try and mold it to bow to the doctrine of Rome. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I am horrified when I see people messing with the scripture, playing fast and loose with the scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a sense of pure horror in me when I do that. And you, you know, you must, you know, the, and each denomination, each church will tell you, well, their scripture is inerrant. Well, I have news for you. Only God's truth is inerrant, not man's truth. And that's the way you need to look at the gospels. You know, if it comes from God, it's his truth. If it doesn't, if it's been inserted, and you know, the, the wonderful bounty of doing this research is that we can tell what has been inserted, like in John 6, 4, for example, and we've been able to come up with more evidence than I thought possible that there was no historical precedent to John 6, 4. It was definitely an insertion. It says it is. It's a third person insertion, and it was wrong. The Greek Gentiles didn't know the Hebrew feast days. They did edit the books of the Bible, and things got changed or put in there that are just wrong, and we can now identify them, which is really, really uplifting. You know, we, mm -hmm. can, we, can, yeah. we can find our way to God's truth, and uh, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be recovering the received text of the Bible and identifying yeah. things that have been inserted in it. And they're not all bad. I mean, look, you know, open the, the Bible to, to John. It says at the top, John. That was it, was, not, it was not published under that name. And then you have chapter one. There were no chapter markings. And then you have the little summary, which was not in the original. And then you have the verse markings. They were not in the original. So things have been added, and those are worthwhile. They're valuable. But the idea that nothing has been added to Scripture is, is simply not true. We yeah. know there are... Well, you Editing have uh, pointed out in your book, and this is really uh, an exhaustive detail, not only historically, but the research that you've done into this and in, in establishing these truths. Uh, you point out that there are, in extent, about 5,400 uh, Greek manuscripts. Right. And they, they don't agree with each other. They're, right, they're, they're, every they don't one match. of them, yeah, there are they're, they're changes. It's, and the only way that could have happened is if the priests who are copying them changed them. That's the only way it could have happened. Right, some of it is by omission, some mm -hmm. is error, some, some is of error. it is deliberate. Yes, they deliberately some is deliberate. inserted these things to go along with their theology. Mm -hmm. And one thing you don't want to get involved with is Greek pagan theology. <laughs> wow. That's as as the Paul truth. said, uh, you, you know, at one time you were pagans. You were heathen Gentiles. Uh -huh. You were without God, without hope. You couldn't find your rear end with both hands in the dark, I think it says in one of the ancient texts. Right. 
But you know that, that's where the, the Gentile world is from. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Without God, without hope, they didn't, the, the scriptures weren't given to them mm -hmm. until yeah. the Israelites brought it to them. Right, and the, the, if you're talking about the Brit Halashah, the renewed covenant of the New Testament, people tend to forget that Yeshua's whole ministry was to the Jews and he fulfilled that. So he died on the cross that the Jews might be saved. Then he was resurrected. Then he included the Gentiles That's in right. the mission. Mm -hmm. But only Absolutely. that. So, you know, he was dying for the Jews, not, right. not to have them so persecuted. So his disciples don't go into the way of the Gentiles. Don't even go to the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. First. That's, that is your mission. You know, after the resurrection, then go into the whole world. Right. Then he opened it, up opened it up. The franchise for Gentile believers to come in and thank Yehovah that he did. And we are grafted into the tree of Abraham equal to anyone else. Right. Because of Absolutely. our belief in the son, uh, the son of Yehovah. That's why it's so horrifying when you see people playing fast and loose with the Bible to justify creating a Greek church. I mean, just tick it off, tick off the Ten Commandments and see which ones they didn't break. I mean, you know, they, they, it says you shall not take the name of God in vain. In, in Hebrew, that's shov, which means to nothing. You shall not take the name of God to nothing. And, and what they have they done? Erased it. Erased it. Now, by now, Find me a modern day Bible that has the name of God in it. Uh, I don't, I hope there is one, but I don't frankly know what they are. So it was completely taken out. The honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, gone. Because of John 6, 4, you can see on the chart, the Passover was moved up a couple of years where you had Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, that is the Good Friday. Easter Sunday, Lord's Day doctrine, right there in a nutshell. That's what they used to sanctify changing the day of worship from the Sabbath day to the Lord's Day, which is the first day of the week, Sunday. So, and that's, that's just an abomination. It's, it, just, it just burns to see people so, so obviously, you know, playing with the Bible to create their own doctrine, change the name of God, Changed that they needed a Greek God, a Greek Jesus, and you do have a Greek Jesus. That by the time of the Gospels, by the time of Mark, you have an archetype of the Greek Jesus who rejects Torah is now overwhelming the Hebrew Yeshua who upholds Torah. So you really have a dichotomy between the the Hebrew archetype. And the, and the Greek archetype. It is the same person, but the way they are perceived in the Hebrew and the Greek gospels are sometimes diametrically opposed. You know, if, you take, so, okay. if you take the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, which was created to crush the resurgent Messianic church, huge numbers, quarter of a million Jews converted. So you had, a, you had their own bishops, their own priests, their own churches, but uh, they, they were, were trying to crush that. So you had these Messianic believers who literally died with, before giving up their faith. They were very brave. Many of them absolutely refused to recant. But then on the other side, you have Roman priests who fervently believe it is their duty to torture and kill these fellow believers because they have wrong doctrine. And that wrong doctrine is basically I, I, I missed Judah. that instruction from Yeshua. <laughs> yeah. But you have, obviously, these two people are operating from different archetypes. Mm -hmm. How do you take right. any solace that this is the same person when you got a manuscript tradition in Greek and a manuscript in Greek and Latin and one in Hebrew and they're telling totally different stories here? You know, and we're upholding, these people were upholding their belief in the Hebrew Messiah and they were being crucified for it. And then the other archetype is that of the, the Roman priests who felt it was their duty to torture and kill fellow believers, you know, as a question of doctrinal purity. You know, they were Judaizers. Absolutely, they had the Hebrew well, that, Gospels. Yeah, that, that, that terminology, that is the, uh, that's the incendiary point, is it not? Yeah. You know, if they're keeping the feasts, if they're keeping the Sabbath, if they're following the commandments of God. If they're keeping then, the word in Hebrew. Yeah, 
then they're Judaizers. Yes. Whenever you hear someone use the term Judaizer people, you need to understand these people are, are, are completely removed from the scripture. They, they are, they're pagans. They have a paganized religion. They have a paganized Jesus. The people that are condemning them, right? Right, right. Yeah, and and so the the people that are are keeping what Yeshua did and said in obeying the Torah, as he said, do what Moses said to do. Yes. Don't follow the Takanot and Masim of the Pharisees. Right. Don't follow their rules and regulations that they made up. And what have we in Christianity? We've ended up with the rules and regulations of a different brand of Pharisees, and no one's obeying Moses. Uh, there you go. It's there. The church was animated by a rising tide of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons for it. You know, they were getting persecuted for being members of this messianic movement. But, uh, and, uh, but really, the, at heart, it's that the new Greek church claimed the mantle of the chosen people and vilified the, the messianic church and the Jews in general as being... Uh, demonized by God. God hated them because they had killed his son. Well, they didn't. Right, there right. was only a few people that did that. Herod engineered it. He wasn't a Jew. The masses of Jews were, you know, they were afraid to even touch him because the masses of Jews thought of him as a, as a prophet. Mm -hmm. So they're taking the mantle of the chosen people and in all right thinking, that goes to the Messianic church. They are... Jews, they are children of Abraham who have accepted the Son of God and his message and embraced it with all their heart and putting their bodies on the line in, in martyrdom to uphold it and to preserve it throughout the centuries. Those, those, they are the chosen people. The mantle of the chosen people goes to them. Now the church has appropriated it. Everything that belonged to the Jews is now ours. The scripture, Jerusalem, all of it is now ours. And so to, to animate this, you've got to have a lot of anti-Semitism going. And that's really what has driven it throughout the millennium because it's been consistent, is that the, the Christians have consistently taught anti-Semitism uh, to, their, to their flocks. Right, right. And I mean, do you think Adolf Hitler could have done what he did without the German churches teaching and preaching anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews? That's where all of that started, with the stealing of the mantle of the election of the chosen people by the Christians. So this is their target. This mm -hmm. are people that they're trying to destroy. The Messianic Church and the, the Hebrew Gospels. This is the real competitor. This is the real inheritor of the mantle of the chosen people. And in his munificence, Yeshua is today, tomorrow, and forever. He's a Hebrew rabbi welcoming everybody into the fellowship of belief in, in Yehovah and his son. Everybody equally alike, whether they're Hebrew, Greek, or Gentile. I'm glad that you brought that up, Miles, because, uh, you know, he said, do not be called rabbi. You know, you got one rabbi. You know, rabbi means, in Hebrew, means great one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it doesn't mean teacher. This is, what, this is what modern people will say rabbi means. But no, rabbi means great one. Rav, great one. Mm -hmm. you, know, you got one great one. All you guys are all on the same level, okay? You are, you know, you've got one master, you've got one father in heaven, don't be calling anybody else pope, papa. Right, uh, which means don't do father, it. by the way. Right, <laughs> uh-huh. And, and uh, of course, the, the Roman Catholic Church, what do they call their priest? Father. Fathers. So they immediately go and break all of these things that are clear prohibitions in mm -hmm. the Bible before the eyes of God. I mean, you can't tick off, you know, it's okay to lie to heretics, you know, it's okay. You can you can offer them safe passage and then revoke it in order to seize them and, and to burn them. You, you you know, there's nothing. There's no there is no commandment that was not broken in the persecution of the messianic the neo messianic mm -hmm. movements, the various groups of churches in there and that were principally, you know, well, Lombardi we know was a, a center of it, but the Cathars in 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 
in France, southern France, and the, the conversos in Spain, all of these people have historically documented con contacts with the early Christians, the early Messianic church. Certainly the conversos, they had the Hebrew gospels. Mm -hmm. The Cathars had their Bible. They were Gauls. The Galatians were Gauls. So early, one of the earliest churches, they were Gauls. They were communicating with these people. They were the same people. They spoke the same language. They got their materials from the Galatians and formed the, the Cathar Bible. And then the, the Waldensians and Lombardi, they came straight from, they came straight from Rome and, and, and you know the Jewish, early Jewish Messianic movement there that was basically pushed out by Constantine's de declaration they were heretics as the beginning of persecution of the of the Messianic Church, or pushed out into northern Italy. So the Messianic Church, it lived, it survived, and it was constantly playing a part in history, a lot bigger part than than is known. We mentioned Columbus. We mentioned the the Messianics in the in the New World. They played a huge part in the Reformation. Almost all of the Reformation Bibles according to their authors and editors, came from the Waldensians' preservation of the received texts of the Bible, the Itala and Lucian's Greek Bible and the Hebrew Gospels that had been passed down to them, documented over the, over the, from the very first they had these books and they preserved them through centuries of persecution. They, they, they held on to these at, at the cost of their lives many times so that we today can, can have them and resurrect the received text because we certainly, we certainly need to do that. That's well, for sure. Yeah. Well, this is a, a wonderful time to be alive in which we're, uh, you know, we're, we're able to, to go back in time and recapture uh, and the essence of the faith once delivered to the saints. And, and I loved how you began your book uh, because right at the very beginning, you talk about the martyrs and dedicating this, this to the martyrs, those who, who gave their lives that they knew that they were going to die because they were teaching the truth, they were holding on to the truth, and, and it, this seems to be something that's lost in our culture. It's like, you know, uh, it's my rights, my rights, instead of uh, saying that the, the kingdom in the coming kingdom and our responsibilities that we will have according to what we've done in this life, this is where our reward is. Mm -hmm. And we, we really need to be aware of the, the truth because that's, you talk about the, the, the Roman priests persecuting the, the messianics all in the name of the savior, right? right? Well, the truth is that we are all martyrs. We all face life and death in this world. And none of us is getting out of here alive, I can tell you that. We all face life and death. And when it comes to that moment of going home, your loved ones are going to be surrounding you. And they're gonna either see terror in your eyes and go away really shaken. And are they're gonna see you praising Yehovah for the blessings in your lives. And they're gonna say, that's the faith I wanna have. Amen. Amen. Miles, thank you so much for being with us. I encourage everyone uh, to get your new book, Sons of Zion versus the Sons of Greece, and to dig into our history because it is our history. This is our heritage. These are the people that we, we earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to them. And, uh, and th this is uh, going to be a new dawn if we will latch on to the power of God and operate in our roles as priests and kings yeah. in this generation. Exactly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Miles, for, for uh, sharing these things. Uh, make sure you pick up Miles' book. It is so deep uh, that... Uh, um, the, the things that, that I've been attempting to teach for years in putting together chronologies, uh, Miles has done a, just a masterful job in, in bringing in the uh, historical records that allow us to understand that the word of God, as is originally given, is without error. There is no fault with the word of God. There may be errors in what men have added and deletions in, uh, that, that have happened uh, by accident, but we still have 
the very testimony of these men who lived and walked with Yeshua and so we can learn to walk as he walked. Thank you for being with us. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now and until Yeshua returns. Amen, amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov, have a good week and we'll see you back here next week for another lesson in living. Shalom. <laughs>